In our headlines on this Wednesday afternoon, January 17th, here on the peninsula. South Korea slaps fresh sanctions against North Korea in light of the latter's most recent military provocations. And on the blacklist, this time around, are two individuals, three institutions and 11 vessels. Meanwhile, Russia's Vladimir Putin meets with North Korea's top diplomat, Choi Sun hee on Tuesday in Moscow for talks on issues of bilateral interest amid mounting security concerns. Over in the Middle East, the U.S. maintains its strikes of land-based Houthi targets in Yemen that include rebel command centers, weapon storage facilities, radar systems and launch sites. We begin with news of Seoul's latest sanctions against Pyongyang in response to the latter's most recent ballistic missile test. And this time, the punitive action also targets North Korean vessels. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Pyongyi, tells us why. South Korea said it would independently impose a new set of sanctions on North Korea as it seeks to prevent the regime's illicit maritime activities and squeeze its funding sources. Newly added to the blacklist are 11 ships, two individuals and three entities involved in activities that violate UN Security Council resolutions, such as maritime transfers with North Korean vessels and the import of refined oil or coal smuggling to the north. Seoul's foreign ministry said Wednesday that North Korea has been procuring materials and funds including oil through these activities in order to develop its nuclear and missile programs. It also said this is the first time in about eight years that the government is imposing sanctions on ships since March 2016. Of the 11 ships placed on the list, South Korea is the first country to issue sanctions on nine of them. With the sanctions now in place, the captain of these ships must have domestic entry approval from the regulatory authority before entering South Korea. As for the blacklisted individuals and entities, those wishing to engage in financial transactions with them must obtain permission from the governor of the Bank of Korea or the Financial Services Commission. The latest sanctions come just three days after North Korea fired an intermediate-range ballistic missile, which could be capable of targeting U.S. military bases in Guam or Japan. The regime claimed the next day that it has successfully tested a solid fuel missile carrying a hypersonic warhead, which makes such missiles harder to intercept. Pyongyang has been raising tensions on the Korean Peninsula in recent weeks, with its leader Kim Jong-un saying that he has no intention of avoiding war with South Korea. Pyongyang Arirang News. Russian President Vladimir Putin met with North Korea's top diplomat Choi sun hee at the Kremlin on Tuesday amid growing concerns here over the two countries' broader cooperation. Our Ian Jin reports. On Tuesday, the Kremlin said that North Korean Foreign Minister Choi sun hee held rare talks in Moscow with President Vladimir Putin. During the meeting, Choi briefed Putin about her earlier meeting with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. No details were given regarding the talks, but arms deals are among the possible items on the agenda, as well as Putin's potential visit to Pyongyang. According to Che, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un invited President Putin to North Korea amid deepening ties since the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. The fact that there's a meeting of foreign ministers now to strengthen their friendship once again proves the friendly relations between Russia and North Korea, which have a long history and tradition of friendship, move forward with energy in accordance with the plans of the two leaders. The two ministers also discussed the implementation of agreements reached during Kim's visit last September. Military cooperation between Moscow and Pyongyang has been deepening, with the North providing Russia with arms for use in its war with Ukraine, in exchange for Russia providing technical assistance for the North's weapons program. The Kremlin called the North its closest neighbor and partner. The United States and its allies have condemned what they say have been significant North Korean missile deliveries to Russia to help its war effort. But both Russia and North Korea have repeatedly dismissed the criticism. Ian Jin, Arirang News. And come Thursday this week, top nuclear delegates representing Seoul, Tokyo and Washington will sit down for talks here on threats posed by Pyongyang. According to Seoul's foreign ministry, special envoy for peace and security affairs on the Korean peninsula, Kim Gan, will meet with his American and Japanese counterparts, Chong Pak and Hiroyuki Namatsu, respectively, in capital Seoul tomorrow. 
Separately today, that is Wednesday, bilateral talks are being held between Kim and his Japanese counterpart. Meanwhile, on the trilateral agenda are North Korea's persistent provocations and military collaboration with Russia. In a show of might amid security concerns here, Seoul, Tokyo and Washington engage in a three-day maritime drill in waters of Jeju Island that began on Monday. According to Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff, a total of nine ships partook in the drill, including Seoul's Aegis destroyer, Sejong the Great, Washington's aircraft carrier, the USS Carl Vinson, and Tokyo's Kongo-class destroyer. This is reportedly the largest number of vessels involved in a trilateral exercise and seeks to bolster defense capabilities against Pyongyang's nuclear and maritime threats, including the ability to intercept the transportation of weapons of mass destruction. Meanwhile, President Yoon suk yeol earlier on Tuesday warned North Korea against any act of provocation, asserting that the punishment would be many times greater. Our presidential office correspondent Kim do covers his remarks. Just hours after North Korea's state media reported on Kim Jong-un's decision to constitutionally label South Korea as the regime's number one hostile country, President Yoon suk yeol didn't shy away when hitting back with remarks of his own. 이는 북한 정권 스스로가 반민족적이고 반역사적 집단이라는 사실을 자인한 것입니다. On the contrary, South Korea's constitution says the nation's territory is all of the Korean peninsula and that it shall seek peaceful unification based on democratic order. The comments came at a planned cabinet meeting where the president usually broadcasts his opening statements live. There he also reiterated that the nation is ready to retaliate against any provocation multiple times stronger. And referring to the statement that Pyongyang will not be recognizing the Northern Limit Line, the defector inter-Korean maritime border, Yoon said it's an attempt to make people anxious and divide South Korea. In fact, he called for unity to fight against the propaganda. 전쟁이냐, 평화냐를 협박하는 재래의 위장 평화 전술은 더 이상 통하지 않습니다. 우리 국민과 정부는 하나가 되어 북한 정권의 기만 전술과 선전 선동을 물리쳐 나아가야 합니다. And amidst the exchange of harsh words, he underscored that the true threat is not the people of North Korea, but its regime. 북한 주민들은 우리와 똑같이 자유와 인권과 번영을 누릴 권리를 가진 우리와 같은 민족입니다. 우리는 이들을 따뜻하게 포용해 나가야 합니다. And despite North Korea's deciding to shut down all agencies related to inter-Korean relations, President Yoon ordered for more work to be done by South Korea's unification ministry. Specifically, he said the nation will do more to help North Korean defectors settle in South Korea and said the ministry needs to legally designate a day to celebrate the North Korean defectors. He also called on the foreign ministry to cooperate with the global community to help and protect the defectors. Kim do Arirang News. And President Yoon suk also says Korea's capital market should be rendered more supportive of people's livelihoods. His remarks came during the fourth policy briefing open to members of the public earlier on this Wednesday, during which finance-related officials spoke of intentions to double the sum of savings exempt from taxation for individual savings accounts. The government is also reportedly devising debt management programs and interest reduction initiatives, as well as safety nets for individual investors in the stock market. President also urged for efforts to make the local financial market fair and more competent globally. Security concerns and their broader consequences on global stability and prosperity took center stage of talks at the World Economic Forum over in Davos on Tuesday. Our Kim Jong-shil reports. 
global leaders are discussing concerns over geopolitical tensions as they gather in Davos, Switzerland. Leaders from around the world for the second year in a row discussed how to end the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky met with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg on Tuesday. The NATO Secretary General said, quote, support for Ukraine is not charity, it's an investment in our own security, promising more military support for Ukraine. President Zelensky also spoke at the forum. They must gain air superiority for Ukraine just, just as we have gained superiority at the Black Sea. We can do it, but let's know what's needed and in what quantities. Zelensky added that frozen Russian assets should be directed toward rebuilding Ukraine. Another key topic was the situation in Gaza and the Red Sea attacks by the Houthi rebels. Qatari Prime Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdulrahman Assani said the current situation is extremely concerning. We see like it's the most dangerous escalation right now because it's not affecting only the region, it's affecting the global trade as well. He said the world needs to focus on the main issue, which is Gaza, to get everything else to calm down, while stressing diplomacy is preferable over any military resolution, referring to the U.S. and U.K. retaliations on the Houthis. Escalating North Korean provocations were also discussed at the forum. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said North Korea worries him, but stressed the more others seek to undermine the international system through violence and coercion, the more it brings U.S. allies and partners closer. The 54th World Economic Forum annual meeting will last until Friday. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. And over in the Middle East, U.S. defense authorities continue their strikes against land-based Houthi targets in Yemen in response to the rebels' rampant assaults on Western ship, ship status in regional waters. Our Isinje has the latest. The U.S. Central Command says its military has launched a third strike against Houthi militants in Yemen, destroying four anti-ship ballistic missiles set to be launched at ships in the Red Sea. Speaking to Reuters, two unnamed U.S. officials said the preemptive strikes were carried out as the missiles created an imminent threat to commercial vessels and U.S. warships in the area. The latest strikes come after a second successful Houthi attack on a commercial ship in two days, after the militant group claimed responsibility for attacking a Maltese-flagged bulk carrier on Tuesday. The U.S. and the U.K. have attacked dozens of missile and radar sites used by Iranian-backed Houthi militants in Yemen since January 11th. The U.S. Central Command also announced on Tuesday that the U.S. Navy has seized Iranian weapons that were intended for Houthis in Yemen. The Navy seized a ballistic missile and cruise missile components from a vessel off the coast of Somalia last week. The Central Command said that with the latest seizure, it's clear that Iran continues the shipment of advanced lethal aid to the Houthis, a clear violation of UNSC resolutions. The raid was conducted using helicopters and drones participating in the operation. Despite the ongoing operations to stop the Iran-backed rebels from attacking commercial ships in the Red Sea, Houthis have claimed responsibility for attacking a Greek-owned Maltese-registered cargo ship in the Red Sea. The militant group spokesman said that the Yemeni rebels targeted the ship with naval missiles on Tuesday as it was heading to Israel, resulting in a direct hit. The bulk carrier was traveling north to the Suez Canal when it was attacked, but there were no reports of injuries. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. And staying in that region, Israel and Hamas have sealed a deal for relief support into Gaza and medicine for the hostages held by the Palestinian militant group. The deal was brokered by Qatar and France, and according to the latter, negotiations had been ongoing for weeks. Medical supplies will be offered to 45 hostages, while humanitarian aid will be delivered to people in Gaza. Among the 240 people kidnapped by Hamas during its October 7th assault, 132 people are believed to remain captive. Accordingly, the U.S. has shared hopes for their prompt release. 
In other news, South Korea's defense exports to Poland amounted to over 1.1 billion U.S. dollars last year. According to the Korea International Trade Association earlier on this Wednesday, the amount marks a 184% surge on year. Shipments included FA-50 fighter jets and K-9 howitzers. Meanwhile, total exports to Poland in 2023 hit over 9 billion U.S. dollars, up almost 15 percent on year, making Korea's second largest, making Poland, that is, Korea's second largest export market in Europe after Germany. And as we reported in our earlier newscast, South Korea-born American actor Stephen Young was applauded for his role in the Netflix series Beef at the Emmy Awards Monday night in Los Angeles. Up next, our Ioni covers his response to his Emmy win. South Korea-born American actor Stephen Young has captured the first Emmy of his career for his role in the Netflix series Beef. He won the Outstanding Lead Actor Award in a limited series or TV movie at the 75th Primetime Emmy Awards, which took place on Monday local time in Los Angeles. Beef is a comedy drama where Yeon stars as Danny Cho, a second-generation immigrant working as a building contractor who becomes embroiled in a road rage confrontation. Well, our goal was never to silo ourselves as separate. Uh, we want to connect with everybody. We're telling human stories. While talking about the impact of the series, Yeon also expressed his gratefulness to be living in a time where differences are appreciated. Honestly, I feel blessed that we live in this time where we can all kind of like see past ways in which we separate ourselves, celebrate those, but also come together. It feels really nice. Yeon's co-star Ali Wong won Outstanding Lead Actress in the same category. Beef won a total of eight awards at the Emmys, including Outstanding Limited or Anthology Series and Outstanding Directing for the show's creator, Korean-American Lee Sung-jin. Steven Yeon has picked up multiple awards in the U.S. for his role in Beef. The Emmys comes just over a week after the Golden Globes, where Yeon and Ali Wong became the first actors of Asian descent to win in their categories. He also took home Best Actor in the limited series at the Critics' Choice Awards. Ian Hee. Arirang News. Back on the local front, Seoul Fashion Week for this year's autumn and winter collection opens on the 1st of February. According to Seoul City officials, the event will run for five days at Dongdaemun Design Plaza and S Factory in Songsudong, a district here in Seoul that has emerged as a new fashion mecca for younger people. Seoul Fashion Week takes place six weeks earlier than the Big Four of New York, Paris, Milan and London. A total of 21 runway shows are scheduled with 15 at DDP and 6 at S Factory. Last year, K-pop girl group New Jeans was selected as the global ambassador for Seoul Fashion Week and they will continue that role this year. Five holidays here in Korea have been granted national heritage status for their cultural value. Our Chaewonjo tells us what they are. During the Lunar New Year, South Koreans pay their respects to their ancestors, wishing for luck and blessings for the coming year, and eat tteokguk or sliced rice cake soup. On the day of Taeborum, South Koreans celebrate the first full moon and wish for a bountiful harvest by eating glutinous rice and burning a straw house. Though food and recreational activities have been added over time, Koreans have practiced these customs since before the era of the Three Kingdoms. We can say our nation's holiday culture has been established since the Three Kingdoms era, and its uniqueness and diversity transmitted, systemized, and inherited during the Goryeo dynasty. The Korean New Year, Tano, Chuseok, and Dongji share similar roots. Diverse customs centered around family and community harmony in an agrarian society have been passed down for centuries. South Korea's five representative holidays were designated national intangible cultural heritages because these traits were highly regarded. The historical significance, uniqueness and representative aspect of them, as well as the potential for reviving the value of family and communal consciousness, make the designation of these holidays meaningful. In particular, Tano, which has a diverse communal participation culture, and Tungji, where red bean porridge is eaten to ward off evil spirits, are unique features that set South Korea apart from other Asian countries that follow the lunar calendar.
National intangible cultural heritages have evolved from initially focusing on transmission through designated experts to encompassing communal culture like yunnori and now everyday customs that citizens have preserved together. Starting from the upcoming Lunar New Year, the day will carry the meaning of being a national cultural heritage. Chong Wonju, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. In the United States, former President Donald Trump is attending a trial in New York over the defamation of E. Jean Carroll. He is accused of making defamatory statements against Carroll in 2019. This comes just one day after Trump won the Iowa Republican caucuses. Both Trump and Carroll attended a Tuesday trial where opening statements and jury selection was made. Carroll, who is seeking $10 million in damages, is expected to testify when trial resumes on Wednesday local time. A separate trial last year found Trump liable for sexually abusing Carol, but not of raping her, and also found Trump liable for defaming Carol in statements made in 2022. Elizabeth Jean Carroll is a former magazine columnist who alleged that Trump raped her in a department store in mid-1990s, then defamed her by denying any wrongdoings. In the U.S., where a suspected serial killer, already charged with multiple murders of sex workers on Long Island, New York, last year, was charged again on Tuesday with the fourth killing. 60-year-old Rex Herman, a Manhattan architect, was charged Tuesday at the Suffolk County Courthouse on Long Island in connection with the death of a 25-year-old Maureen Brainard Barnes, whose remains were found near Gilgo Beach in 2010. Hewman was charged last July with the first-degree murder of three sex workers in their 20s, whose bodies were among the 11 sets of human remains found in 2010 and 2011 in the same area. The new charge comes as a result of DNA evidence linking Hewman to the death. He has pleaded not guilty to all of the charges. In the Middle East, a report by Iran state media late on Monday said Iran's Revolutionary Guards Corps attacked Israel's spy headquarters in Iraq's Kurdistan region with ballistic missiles. Authorities say four people were killed and six wounded in the attack. Iran's Revolutionary Guards said the strike was a response to recent military action by Israel. However, Iraq's government condemned the attack for leading to civilian casualties. The IRGC also reported a strike against Islamic State in northern Syria. Two rare white animals have been spotted in different parts of the globe. A white Omuras whale was captured on video by tourists off the coast of Phuket, Thailand, in what could be the first known instance of an albino Omuras whale. The Thai tour company named the rare whale Thalang. Meanwhile, in Antarctica, a white penguin was found and recorded at the Gabriel Gonzalez Videla base. The female Gentoo penguin is normally characterized by its black and white feathers with a white spot on the top of its head. This rare penguin was found mostly white due to leucism. Leucism is a genetic condition caused by a partial loss of pigmentation, whereas albinism affects all melanin production, meaning a complete lack of pigment. Kim Xiong. Arirang News. Good afternoon. Wintery precipitation is in the forecast across Korea. Southern provinces could see 5 to 20 millimeters of showers. Central regions could see snow instead of rainfall. And until Thursday, mountainous regions of Gangwon-do province could see more than 8 centimeters of snowfall. Meanwhile, east coast regions stay dry with a dry advisory in place. East of Gangwon-do province will be quite windy as well, but the dry spell should ease with that wintry precipitation. Temperatures will stay above norms in most places. Afternoon highs are slightly lower with the absence of sunshine. Then here in Seoul, tomorrow we'll see a high of 10 degrees Celsius.
But for today, Seoul gets up to 3 degrees, Busan topping out at 12 degrees Celsius. And air quality in Incheon and south of Gyeonggi-do province will be bad all day. The warming trend continues through the weekend before a big chill arrives early next week. Meanwhile, those in the east of Gangwon-do province should keep an umbrella handy. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. On that note, we end this edition of the Daily Report. Coming up next is our panel session, so do stay with us.